you very much, John. So I was hired to talk about the most beautiful class of tensor triangulated categories that is out there, the GF invariant state homotopy categories. <laughs> <laughs> so during my lecture, he will be a part of you. Many of you probably already know that there's a more general world out there. So, for example, much of what I can do, or well, much of what I'm going to talk about can be done for compact Lie groups that act. There's even more general classes, Lie groups, not necessarily compact, cofinite groups, um, discrete groups. But uh, for this audience and for this program, I think that's probably enough to talk about the finite groups. That's what probably more people care about than the more general situations, anyhow. Um, so, the the aim that I think I should be able to achieve even in this talk is to formally define what the G equivariance state homotopy category is, including the triangulated structure. It also has a tensor structure that I will probably not talk about. But before I go there, I wanted to spend a little bit time on motivation. So trying to motivate why uh, you might care about this category. And this motivation will come from algebraic topology uh, spaces with symmetries. Um, so that's kind of one way how you can motivate it. So suppose we're interested about in, in G spaces. And so that's a topological space um, on which the group is finite group X through self homeomorphisms that X continuously. Um, of course, you could really be interested in the actual homeomorphism type of reaction, but since we're homotopy theorists, so or at least I am, and some of you are, that's probably not what you're interested in. You're, so you're somewhat interested in the activating homotopy type. So what could that mean? Well, there's a strong motion, so let me just. Uh, define that so a G map, which would mean a continuous map between G spaces f from x to y, is a G homotopy equivalent. If there's a G map in the other direction, g from y to x, such that. The two composites are homotopic to the respective identities. So this is going to be homotopic to the identity of Y. And this is a G equivariant homotopy. So a continuous one parameter family through maps, all of which are equivalent. And in the other direction also, and F after G is also G homotopy to the identity of X. So maybe you want to start uh, G spaces after this notion of equivalence. One and then one the ways to Did I do something wrong? Yes. 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 This is um, okay, so already um, without the group of symmetries there, I mean, one can study this, but somehow um, experience has shown that it's not such a great idea. If you want to study all topological spaces up to this notion of homotopy, it's just sort of too wide a class and you can't really uh, get a hold of anything. So um, people have sort of agreed on studying either CW complexes up to homotopy um, or what amounts to the same thing, study spaces up to the weaker notion of equivalence is called weak homotopy equivalence, and you can do the same thing um, for uh, groups of symmetries also. Um, so we really want, we want to study these equivalently only on GCW complexes. So that's the equivalent notion of the CW complex where you well, the easiest way to say it, it's just the CW complex with a cellular action that has a special property that you know if a cell intersects a translate of it, then it's actually the identity on that cell. That's maybe the easiest way. Or you study up to weak homotopy equivalence, up to weak G equivalence. So a map is not a G homotopy equivalence, but a G weak equivalence if the uh, induced map on fixed points. Is a weak equivalence of just non equivalent spaces. The weak homotopy equivalence for all subgroups H of G. Okay, and this is equivalent because on GCW complexes, every weak equivalence, which in general would be a weaker notion, is actually already a homotopy equivalence. Um, so what are examples of these GCW complexes that you could care about? So for example, uh, uh, for purposes of motivation, I want to mention uh, a theorem due to Ilman. Maybe some of you have a really geometric background, might be interested in manifolds or smooth manifolds with uh, actions by 
uh, with different morphisms, and those are always uh, CW complex, so they meet the structure. So, Ilman's theorem, which I think is quite a difficult theorem, says, for example, that every smooth G manifold admits a CW, GCW structure. So, he really shows that it admits an equivalent triangulation, which in particular implies this. Okay, so now suppose we're interested in some kind of G spaces this way, and for some reason we want to understand them up to geometric equivalence. I don't know, maybe come from some really geometric background. Then non equivalently homology theories are an important tool for studying other questions of algebra topology. And so you might want to do similar things here, and you might want to study homology theories also in this equivalent context. And one way of uh, one very successful way non equivalently was to study spectra which are objects in some triangle category and each spectrum is a cohomology theory and the homology theory and then the even theorem is that subject to suitably defined axioms every homology or cohomology theory arises in this way so you might want to do something similar with symmetries around and in particular you could get cohomology theories if you had a triangulated category that would relate to g spaces in a particular way so g spectra give homology theories on these spaces. So eventually I'm going to introduce what I mean by the Jacker and stable homotopy category. At this point, let's just assume we have the following data. Um, suppose we have a functor that we want to call it sigma infinity, I guess plus, I don't want to base things, uh, which goes from the category of G spaces to the category that I'm going to use this notation. So this is uh, the G equivalent the homotopy category, which I will eventually introduce. So this is tensor triangulated. And suppose that this functor takes um, cofibers, first of all, it takes this joint union to direct sums. And cofiber sequences. So, cofiber sequence, I mean, you have um, a map of spaces, and then the next thing would be the mapping cone. And then, if there's the mapping cone, there's a connecting map to the suspension, then it takes such things to distinguish triangles. So, then we would get cohomology theories in the following way. Then, for every, for every object E in this category, there's now a standard way we can make this assignment. We can define E K G equivalent of A. So A is a G space. Well, we just define it as we take its suspension spectrum, which at this point is just some abstract functor, but eventually it's going to be the suspension spectrum. So this is now an object in this triangle category. And then we can just take morphisms into some appropriate shift of this object. In this J equivalent scale homotopy category. So this gives us a priori a contravariant functor to the groups, but because in A it takes cofiber sequences to distinguish triangles and hence to long exact sequences, this sort of deserves to be called a cohomology theory, and that's what it is. Um, and then ideally, you might want a little bit extra of this. Um, there's supposed to be a tensor product also. Um, maybe only because this is one of the main connecting themes of this whole trimester problem of this workshop. I guess tensor triangulated categories is supposed to be what we all have in common. So you want the tensor product also, and then maybe you want a little bit of extra compatibility. So you might also want an isomorphism from the suspension spectrum unreduced of A, the tensor product, the suspension spectrum unreduced of B. Natural isomorphism to the suspension spectrum of A cross B. Um, this would, in particular, give you that if you have an object in the triangulated category that has a ring structure, so multiplication for the tensor product, then these cohomology theories would be ring valued. And then maybe if you're lucky, then all your favorite cohomology theories are actually represented by object in this way. So that would be what's actually going to happen. Uh, many interesting equivalent cohomology theories on G spaces will be represented, and I will give you some examples of that. Okay, so suppose that this is what we wanted. Um, now, how do we how do we get such a category? How could we approach this? So 
there would be the first thing, if you've not already heard talks about this before, you've never thought about this before, the first thing could be the naive approach. And naive here, you can understand in two ways. It is slightly naive, you don't get really the nice theory, but it's, naive is also used as a technical term in this context for a particular homotopy theory, and it's supposed to be understood in contrast to the adjective genuine, so these also have technical meanings. So the naive theory approach would say that um, a spectrum is just the exact same thing as it would non equivalently be, which for most people for the first time means a sequence of phase spaces and maps from the suspension of one to the next. So you could first say that a G spectrum, G spectrum X is the following data is G spaces space, G spaces n greater equal to zero. And G maps based and continuous from the suspension of one to the next. And then an equivalence would be a morphism from X to Y. The morphisms would be the strict thing. You would have a G map from X and to Y and strictly commuting to the structure map is an equivalence. Well, there would be different ways of setting this up. Maybe the fastest way here would be to say. That if the maps you get on the homotopy correlate over n of omega n x k plus n is a g equivalence. I guess homotopy correlate, I might even make the mapping telescope. So we did this geometric construction. We do this for the x, we do this for the y, and this is for all k. Okay. So if there was no group of symmetries, this would be one perfectly fine way to set up a category of spectrum and the notion of uh, equivalence. So um, this can be done. I mean, this is perfectly fine and it has in fact been useful for all sorts of things. So this is a perfectly legitimate category to consider. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, this would even work much, much more generally because we're not really using any, anything specific about the group here. This would work in the generality of a topological group in general. You could set this up, you would get a stable homotopy theory or a stable infinity category. People have done that um, and it's useful, and this is that this would lead to the stabilization. The stabilization of G spaces. So, Stabilization of something you could take as a, as a vague term, um, but this could be given a rigorous technical meaning if you were to allow me to use the words infinity categories. I sort of promise not to use it, but I guess eventually I will. So um, the point is that the word of triangulated categories that we're supposed to all love um, is great for doing certain things, but it's really hard to formulate and prove universal properties in the language in the world of triangulated categories. Many constructions would like to be universal for something aren't literally universal for a certain property, whereas in the closely related context of state infinity categories, there would be. And so this in particular would, uh, if you took this one category and you inverted these equivalences in the infinity category in sense, you would get a presentable stable infinity category, which is the stabilization initial with the coordinate preserving function. Um, okay, so this, I just wanted to make clear that this naive approach, there's nothing wrong with it. It's not bad, it's even useful. It would work for all homological groups, but it's not what we're gonna do. We're going to do something more complicated, and I want to motivate this a little bit while we're doing something slightly more complicated. So, the main, um, the genuine approach, which again has a technical meaning, it refers to the specific equivariant, stable equivariant homotopy theory. So, um, this is sort of similar, but you will want to invert not just the ordinary suspension, but suspension with one point compactifications of linear representations. So, similar. But you want to make as the smash blank invertible in some sense that we will talk about later for V linear G representations on R vector spaces. And then S V is always the one point compactification. So as I said, it's V doing the point at infinity. Um, so that's what we want to do. Um, somehow, for technical reasons, it's very convenient at many points to insist on orthogonal representations, but I don't think that is essential. So, uh, very soon I will, I will say that these linear spaces, R vector spaces on which we do X, have a scalar product, and that's a variant under the action. 
I don't think this is really, really essential, but somehow many things work out more cleanly and more easily if you sort of think that we make that assumption. For finite groups and compact Lie groups, it's also not a huge restriction because we could always choose an interactive product. Okay, so why um, do we want to invert representations here? So I'm going to also say a few words of motivation about this. So why invert representations here? Is of linear representations in contrast to just inverting as one or equivalently all linear representations on which the group acts trivially. Well, so the first thing to note is not really a motivation for why is that when the group is non-trivial, um, this really gives a different theory. So um, you could either study those things as triangulated categories, which would be the main perspective that we sort of all using here, and then this would be inequivalent triangulated categories, or you could also want to study it from the perspective of model categories or uh, infinity categories, and they would also be inequivalent things. So unless the group is trivial, where of course it makes no difference, um, then this is definitely a different theory. And so this theory has a richer structure. Um, and I want to drop a few keywords and be specific at, at some point. So first of all, if we do this kind of validation, we get transfers, and I plan to return to that um, in the next lecture, but not today. So we will get structure on the equivalent homotopy groups that we wouldn't have um, if we only inverted the trivial representation and structure that would give us many functors as opposed to coefficient systems. So that's maybe something that also people from a more algebraic background have heard about. So that's one reason why we might want to invert these. Um, then the cohomology theories are a little bit richer. The cohomology theories are, are what's called our degraded. So you can arrange for those cohomology theories not to just be integer graded theories, but graded by the representation wing, the representation wing of the group. Um, another thing that we get if we invert all representa linear representations as opposed to just trivial representations is we get a better version of additivity. So not only and is x y which is my notation for a co-product going to be equivalent to the product so this is kind of the basic relation that holds stably but not unstably a wedge of two spaces is not really equivalent to the product but for spectra that's supposed to be true this will also be true for um, g spectra this would already be true in that context if you just invert ordinary representations you sort of force wedges to become equivalent to products but there's going to be a refinement, a strong equivalent refinement of this, even for finite G sets, S, a specific map from S with a disjoint base point added, smashed with X. So this is just a shorthand rotation for an S indexed wedge or an S indexed co product of copies of X. So each point in S is means you have one copy of X. But now the G action is not just individually on each X, it also involves the diagonal action, it also moves the copies around simultaneously. There's a product version of this, you can just take maps from S to X. This is a complicated way of writing an S fold product of X. But here we have a G action by conjugation. We have the given G action on X and the G action in here and the conjugation action. So this is also not just pointwise, the action moves things around. And this would be an equivalent equivalence. Um, is an equivalent in the context square. So this is one of many sides of the same coin that also goes under the name of the liberal isomorphism, for example. So this is a feature we wouldn't have if we just inverted um, the trivial representation score. So I have two more pieces of motivation and then I'll actually define things. So that this property that this genuine category we have, which the naive state organization does not have, it's also something that's relevant from the tensor triangulated perspective, is that the 
compact objects are dualizable objects. So um, the finite GCW complexes uh, become dualizable in the GH invariant state homotopic category. And in fact, it would turn out that the compact objects and the dualizable object, compact has nothing to do with the tensor structure, dualizable is sort of the feature of the tensor structure, that these classes are the same. This wouldn't be true if we just uh, use the main stabilization. So closely related to this, um, there is that closed D manifolds have right here duality in this category. So what does that mean? Well, you know, this is a tensor triangulated category. So there's a unit object, which would be the sphere spectrum. So you could take something into your category and take the functional dual, home into the sphere spectrum. But a non equivalent for manifolds, for compact manifolds, this spanier white dual, as it's sometimes called, can be described geometrically as a tone space of the negative of the tangent one. And this is going to be true equivalently, but only if you uh, decide to work in this richer world. So if you have a G manifold, then the dual of N, which you're supposed to interpret, take the suspension spectrum and then take home into the unit object, this will actually be equivalent to something that people write N to the minus tau, which is supposed to be the virtual tone, the tone spectrum of the negative of the tangent representation. So plus plus somewhere I will plus I will plus here. Then this sort of has the classicity. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Um, and then another thing I want to mention, and then that will be the motivation, is that equivalent homotopy groups have return which are the right objects. Equivalent homotopy groups yield which are the right objects. I just want to mention a few examples. So the first is I will soon introduce what the sphere spectrum is in this context, where I don't assume that during this talk, then this would turn out to be isomorphic to the Burnside dream of the finite group. And depending on how the exercise sessions go, this could be one of the topics that's possibly going to be elaborated on. You know, there are a lot of questions about what I'm actually saying right now, maybe not, but otherwise, say that Bastion have prepared some material to go more into this. Um, specifically, may, many of you might have heard that these two things are supposed to be isomorphic, and usually much fewer people know how an isomorphism goes. And so that's uh, actually an interesting part of the story. So, similarly, there is an equivalent version of the spectrum KU of complex topological K theory if we turn out that it's zero equivalent stable homotopy group with the complex representation ring of the group G. And there will actually be a theory um, which I will call MO, and I will introduce this in Z graded. So there will be an equivalent theory that I'll introduce later today, whose equivalent homotopy groups are isomorphic to the bodice classes of smooth closed. So the bodice of smooth closed. So all of these objects, the sphere spectrum, K theory, this sort of tone spectrum, they have analogs or they can be restricted to objects in the naive theory, but then you will get more boring answers for what they occur in They wouldn't be related to these other objects that have come up in different parts of mathematics. Okay, so that was supposed to be motivating. There's a question. Yes, so we also get the universal property for the genuine stable homotopy category, perhaps the most stable thing categories in the structure, or not? Yes. So I was going to say this later, but I can say it right now. So the model that I will write down, which makes it more rigorous that you want to invert these spheres, is going to be a symmetric monoidal presentable stable infinity category. Suspension spectrum is going to be a strong symmetric monoidal functor. And this data is initial with respect to symmetric monoidal colonial preserving functors that take those spheres to invertible objects. That's something that I think people sort of philosophically knew for a very long time, and it's made mathematically rigorous in the paper by Maya and Gettner and Maya. But I, that was sort of what people knew had to be true anyhow. But I guess before infinity categories came up, it wasn't really clear how you would rigorously formulate that. In that sense, it's universal. <laughs> Any other questions about this motivating part? Okay, so then my next section is going to be the orthogonal spectrum model. So 
So I will explain my favorite model for the GM GM event scale home public category. But before I do that, I want to at least mention uh, in words and with some um, credits, like many other models that have been there previously uh, discussed by other people, because this is by far from the only model. It's just in my personal opinion, if you sort of take the, the interval over the difficulties involved in very parts of the theory, I think this minimizes. This is sort of my personal attitude, which is why I'm using the problem spectrum more. So um, many other things were before that, and I just, I think I'm just going to say them in, in words instead of writing all of this down. So maybe the, the oldest and the most traditional one would be where you take this kind of spectrum up there, a, a sequence of G spaces, and instead of smashing with S1, you would smash with the sphere of the regular representation of G. Instead of the regular representation, secretly, you could use any other representation that contains all the reducible segments at once, but the regular representation is this one. So you would look at a bunch of pointed G spaces Xn, and from one to the next, you don't sustain by S1, but by the regular representation. So John, can, can one even attribute this to a particular person? I mean, this is maybe the earliest how people would have. Should somebody's name be attached to that kind of G-spectrum, or is that? I guess that's in my thesis. Okay, so then really it should be attached to that. So, <laughs> sorry. I mean, this was the old, probably one of the oldest approaches, I, I, I would say. Okay, so after that came many more. And particularly in that approach, it's probably a little bit difficult to uh, uh, to discuss the, the smash product, or I don't know, maybe there was some trick around that makes it, that, that makes it easy. But um, after that came many other models for the general state homotopy category. So for example, there were the Lewis May Steinberg, so called coordinate G spectra. And of course, Mandela and May, who are known for their non-equivalent book, they have equivalent versions. So there's S modules in the sense of end of Chris Mandela May. Then there were different versions of G symmetric spectra, first by Mike Mandel, and later a different one by Marcus Hausmann, which modeled this. And then there were models in terms of continuous functors by Lumberg and a different one by Dundas. Holdix and Ostware, and then of course geoformal spectra, where the main theory was first written up by Mandel and May. And now have I forgotten the informed model? Okay, so I'm going to use the one orthogonal spectrum model um, that was where most of the details were worked out in an AMS memoir by Mandel and May. So you probably ought to mention HHR as well. Yes, although I wasn't going to talk about current need until it yes, so then. In the later part, there was some mistake when it comes to equivalent conductivity, which was sort of like it's discovered in the process of HHR. Okay, so let me first give you a pre-definition, which is not quite the definition, but it's already very close. So in our formal spectrum, OG yet, G will come soon. X consists of the following data. Um, based spaces X of V for all inner product spaces V. So, an inner product space for the course of my lectures is a finite dimensional Euclidean vector space. So, finite dimensional vector space over the real is equipped with the scalar product. Um, and such thing that has an orthogonal group, that's a group of linear isometries, and then some extra data. Um, Equipped with base continuous maps um, S W minus phi of V smash X of V to X of W, which is supposed to generalize this kind of structure maps up there, possibly with other representation spheres. And this is for all linear isometric embeddings. L I E means linear isometric embeddings of such inner product spaces, phi. From V to W. So, R linear maps that preserve the scalar product, and such maps are then, of course, necessarily injective, and I don't insist that they are bijective. So, they're just being isometric embeddings as opposed to isometries. This is the notation for the orthogonal complement, not the set theoretic complement, which is then another vector space. Um, so, you basically go up from dimension V to dimension W, but you have to add in sort of a complementary sphere. Um, so, special cases of this structure maps. It's of course, where this is just the inclusion of a direct sum n, and if this is just the inclusion of a direct sum n, then you get maps from S, the one point compactification of u smash the value at v to the value at the direct sum v. And in some sense, this is the general case because up to isometry, of course, such an inclusion always splits as v and its complement. So 
you can argue how much more general that actually is. But there's one key point. You want this map, um, this is phi lowest down, maybe you want this to vary um, continuously in phi and the whole data to be associative. So let me just say plus associativity plus continuity in phi. So the linear isometries vary in families. There's the linear isometries with, with fixed source and target, they form a space, Schiebel map. They're not just they're not just discrete. We somehow want to remember this. But of course, literally, this doesn't quite make sense to say that this continuously varies in phi because this is a different space than phi varies. And um, now we'll come to the actual definition that makes this precise. It uses continuous functional common index in category. Um, this is really, I think, how one should think about the orthogonal spectrum. But the only issue up is how you make this continuity precise. And that's what I will explain now because I want to actually give it a so there's a very slick way of defining what these objects really are, which is the definition and not just the pre-definition. And this is the kind of definition that you're either going to love or you're going to hate it. Because you know I define a category and I have to continuous functions on it. Some people like that because it's you know so abstract, and some people hate it because it's so abstract. <laughs> Okay, so then we find a category, which is going to be a topological category. So the home spaces are going to have topologies, not the objects. So the category. So in, in writing, I use a blackboard mode. Not a blackboard mode, a bold face O, but I cannot draw that. So I use a blackboard mode O because on the blackboard, you're supposed to use a blackboard mode. Um, okay, so. This has objects all in a product spaces. As you found before, finite dimensional Euclidean vector spaces, and then for the morphism spaces, um, you find this as follows for VW in a product spaces. The set of linear isometric invariants, which I write L, VW. Of linear isometric invariance has a Schiebel manifold topology. It makes it a compact space, even a smooth manifold if you want, compact smooth manifold. So I don't know if you've all seen this immediately. So we're looking at linear maps that preserve the scalar product. So suppose we fixed an orthonormal basis for the source. Then a linear map would be completely determined by what it does on that orthonormal basis, and would have to send it. To an orthonormal frame in W and vice versa. So that means, as a set, the set of linear isometric embeddings is the same as the, uh, the set of n frames in W by evaluating at some fixed orthonormal basis or n is the dimension of V. And that's a Schiffel manifold with a subspace topology of the product. Okay, so this is how we view this as a space. And over this, there is a specific vector bundle, where well, there's several, but we want to use the orthogonal complement vector bundle. Complement vector bundle over this space L of GW has the following total space um, for some reason I started to call it psi so it's pairs W phi in W cross linear isometric embedding from D to W with the property that W is orthogonal on the image of phi. So it's called the orthogonal complement bundle over this space because the fiber over a linear isometric embedding is exactly that thing up there. The fiber over the linear isometric embedding phi is the complement of the image of phi. And that's clearly a vector bundle, it's a sub bundle of the product bundle. And yeah, and then now we form, well, either you could call it the Tom spaces or more easily we just add the point of infinity to this. So the space of this space in this category O, EW is the tone space of this vector bundle. So this is even a Euclidean vector bundle because these things come with inner products. 
the top space of xi is the other group. And now top space can mean different things to different people. It often means if you have a Euclidean vector bundle such as here, you think that this bundle model with the sphere bundle, that's somehow not convenient to describe the structure maps. So it's more convenient to use something homeomorphic, namely just the one point compactification, with the one point compactification topology, which sort of works because we're over a compact base. Because in this formula, it's much easier to describe the composition does. So this gives us now for every pair of inner product spaces. Um, this base space, it's based at the point of infinity, and this comes with composition maps, which in this picture are very easy to write down. So these are supposed to be base maps. So they go from this space, O B W smash O V V U O Q W, and they're very easy to write down. So what's the point in here? Well, it's either the point at infinity, and we're not going to talk about points at infinity. They go to points at infinity, it has to be base maps. So I'm just going to talk about the things which are not the base point. So those are pairs, uh, linear isometric embedding and a vector orthogonal to the image of that. And here's another one, here's the V comma psi. And you basically compose the linear isometric embeddings by alpha psi and to make everything work out, it has to be phi applied to this. And if you write it in this order, as opposed to in the other order, you don't even have to think because just put everything together and one has to act on the other. And so this formula comes out. This is clearly going to be associative and continuous. So we've now defined a category in which we base spaces or a pointed topological category. And now we're just going to define the uniform spectrum. spectrum is a continuous based functor. Um, X on this indexing category to base spaces. So if you press me, spaces are completely generated spaces in the sense of the core. So it includes the household condition, but it's not going to be relevant to exactly which spaces I'm working in. Um, okay, so that's just what an orthogonal spectrum is. And one of the things that could be discussed in the exercises, or that you might want to think about this yourself, is how this abstract and slick definition, how that's related to what I gave you as a pre-definition. So why this structure is really the same structure as that up there, plus the continuity built in and saying that it's sort of continuous on the tom space, because the tom space uh, has the, the five variable families, but then also at the same time, the thing that you're smashing with this sort of variable continuous term. So that's, if you don't see that immediately, that's a good exercise to think about how this abstract definition, why it's really the same data as this. Other one with the difference being this is a rigorous definition and the other one wasn't quite. Okay, so you yes. can comment on this on the topology and this uh, triple manifold topology. So if V and W are, are just uh, Euclidean spaces mm -hmm. and these are linear, these are it's also the function space topology. Is that the question? It's a sub sub thing it's of also the function space of it, it happens to coincide with the function space topology. Right. So it's yes. Right. So if you give the linear spaces the linear topology, then linear maps are continuous, mm -hmm. so it's a subset. Of the set of continuum maps which come with the K5 compact open topology, and it is a closed subspace in that, and it happens to coincide with the subspace topology, which is not topological and also not terribly difficult to show. The map from here to here, this is continuous, the other one is also continuous bijection from complex space to also space. Is that sort of thing? Okay, yeah, it's also the function space topology. <clears throat> Now you know I'm lost somehow. Ah, okay. So this is an orthogonal spectrum. But we want an orthogonal G spectrum. And luckily, although I know that Peter may always say me when I does this, it's very easy to make a definition of orthogonal G spectrum now, because an orthogonal G spectrum is just a function to G topological based spaces. So these are G spaces with a G fixed base point. And the, the fact that some people, like in particular Peter may always complain about is that as far as the homotopy theory is concerned, such things should be evaluated not on inner products, maybe inner products, but on representations, but I'm not doing that here. But it turns out on the one category, then you just don't need to do this. So this defines a category that's equivalent. I think it's much simpler. So you can, if you want, you can ignore this last comment. This is just the definition. It's a continuous factor from this index in the category to G spaces. That's one of the four G So now, unless there are more questions, I was planning to give some examples. Any questions about this definition? Okay, so now let's give some examples. So the first one is the sphere spectrum, which had already come up. 
the sphere state from S is some kind of the values first. The value of the inner product space is the one on compactification, and then I have to give you the structure map OVW. I have to give you maps from OVW slash SV to SW, and this sends a pair W, phi slash V to W plus phi. Of, v. of course, the base point and infinity goes to the base point of infinity. So this is just the sphere spectrum. It's a collection of spheres of these inner product spaces. Connected by suspension maps that are extremely natural in this context. And you see it's a very simple formula here. So here's an exercise which is also very useful if you if you see this for the first time. I define orthogonal spectra as functors on something, covariant functors. And then of course they are representative examples. And you can take your favorite inner product space and you just take the representative function out of it, and that's going to give you an orthogonal spectrum. And the sphere spectrum is actually isomorphic. To the representative of the spectrum by the zero vector space. I think this is a very useful example if you happen to see this for the first time. It's a complete trivialty, but I think it makes a lot of sense to just go through this. Um, so the next example is suspension spectrum. You know, this is important. I mentioned we want to transport G spaces into the stable world, so we should have some functor that does this for us. So A is a G space, or let's say a base G space. And so the slick way would be take this example and smash it object wise with A, but I'm going to expand this now. So the suspension spectrum of A at V is going to be S V smash A. So A has a base point. If A doesn't have a base point, I sometimes put a plus here, which means we add a disjoint base point. But right now A has a base point. And then the structure maps are defined in exactly the same way here. A just acts as a dummy pad. So the structure maps are now maps from OVW smash SV smash A to SW smash A. And it's the same formula as up there with A acting as a dummy. So W, comma phi, that's a point in here. Smash a vector in G, smash a point in A, that goes to W plus phi of V smash with A. So basically you want these values, and then there's only one natural way to sort of do the control method. Okay. Next example, Albert McLean spectra. <laughs> One nice thing about this particular model is, well, I guess it's also true for many other models. I shouldn't emphasize this. So, one nice thing is that several examples can be written out in closed forms. And I can already give two of you already. Suspensions, the sphere spectrum is, of course, a special case when A is just a zero. And there's a few more, many more actually, that you can write down in closed form. That's one particular appeal, I think, of your form and spectrum approach. So now I'm going to write down either the main spectrum. Before I do that, you know, some people in the audience already have inside information and they know that either the main spectrum is supposed to exist for many functions. So there are many factors. I cannot write them down in closed form. And I think it's not because I'm too stupid. I don't know if anyone can. But for particular kinds of many factors, namely that arise from ZG modules, you can, you can do that. And that's what I'm going to do now. And then again, spectra. From ZG module. Also known as the Gillian group with the G action. M and you know in the homotopy category there are essentially unique objects even for general Mackey functors, but those I cannot write down in closed form in the following spectrum. If somebody can, I'd, I'd love to know. So I have to give you again a base G space for every V, and here's what I'm going to do. I take the reduced linearization on the V sphere. So this is the reduced. Linearization. So what does that mean? That means I take formal linear combinations of points in SV with coefficients in this abelian group M, and I can sort of formally add. So if you want, this is the free abelian group tensor with M. That's the same thing. And I have to give this a topology. You know, this thing is discrete, but this has a topology, and the topology is as quotient of the following: the disjoint union over M greater or equal to zero, M N cross SV to the N and then. You know, something in here is an m tuple of points and coefficients in M, 
This has the topology of the product, and then we divide out an equivalent relation so that elements are really formal linear combinations. And we give it the quotient topology. And this tilde refers to the fact that we also identify in everything some coefficient times the base point of the base point. So we're also dividing out the free abelian group on the elements n times the base point. That's what we were used to. So why the reason that this is a good idea is that. Um, the George Tom's theorem is in the background, which says that this space is actually an Einbergic main space, non equivalently, it would be an Einbergic main space for the group M, the underlying group of M, and of the dimension of whatever the dimension V is. But it also comes with us uh, by a G action through the action on M. So M was a ZG module. So G acts on here, and this is how we consider it as a G space. Um, I should say these are structure maps, and uh, again, very similar as before. So I have to pick the maps from OVW. Smash the reduced linearization of the V sphere to the reduced linearization of the W sphere. And here we call that W phi smash a sum MI VI. So linear combination with labels in the abelian group M and with vectors in SV. And we're sending this to the same sum MI and then W plus the same kind of combination as before. Um, the thing that's not completely obvious is that there is that there are equivalent versions of the Dalton theorem, which will eventually show that this spectrum really has its equivalent homotopy groups concentrated in the zero. I haven't defined equivalent homotopy groups yet, but I will soon. So this object really has them concentrated in degree zero, and the Mackey function you get from it is the Mackey function you get from this ZG module, which is the thing which has H is the H fixed point. So therefore, with the Mackey function, you get the ZG module. You can look at all the collections of fixed points, and these particular Mackey functors, these are not all the special ones, they are realizable in this way by the orthogonal spectrum. Yeah. Questions about this? Otherwise, I have one more example. Okay, and this is something that relates to the geometry of three manifolds. So this is an orthogonal spectrum, that is a boys or form spectrum, and how you want to call it the boys and spectrum. It has already come up before, it's no longer on the board, little m capital O um, as terms, as the following terms. So I have to give you for every inner product space, I have to give you a base space, and I'm going to take the Tom space of the first name of v dimensional subspaces in V plus R infinity. So I take this finite dimensional space V, I add infinitely many copies of R, so that's something infinite dimensional, and you take the first many of V spaces. So that's a classifying space for O N, where N is the dimension of V. This thing comes with a tautological V dimensional bundle over it, and that's the Tom, that's what I'm taking the Tom space of. I'm sort of not denoting the bundle because whenever there's an obvious bundle over the space, I just write, write Tom off. Okay, so it would make a good talk, one or several talks, as to explain why on earth am I taking V plus R infinity. There's lots of variations you could do here. And one of the subtle things in the accurate business is that many things which would be equivalent non equivalently are suddenly inequivalent equivalent. So, for example, a different option here would be to take infinitely many copies of V as opposed to V plus R infinity. This would non equivalently not make a difference. But equivalently, this is a different home spectrum which has a provably different equivalent homotopy type. Uh, I do want this particular one so that this is related to, so that the coefficient ring will come out to be the bodies and ring of smooth closed G manifolds. If I want that to come out, I have to take this one and not like the infinity. But I should also tell you what the structure maps are because I claim everything is so nicely explicit. So the structure maps again have to go from O W smash this tom space M O V to the same tom space. With W. So again, I have a linear isometric embedding from B to W, a vector in the complement of the image. Now I have a point in the Tom space. I'm going to write this as how do I want to write it? As V, X, L. So L is a space, it is a point in the base. So L is a V-dimensional subspace of V plus R infinity. And V, X is a point in L. That's what points in the in the topological bundle are where V lies in V. And x lies in the R infinity. This is what the notation is supposed to say. And we want to set this where? Well, the first thing, there's one contribution which might be relatively obvious. So I take W plus phi applied to V 
comma x. So I do the kind of thing that I've done in all the other examples also in the D variable, and the x is just dragged along. And then here you want to take sort of the image of L under the embedding you get from V plus I infinity to W plus I infinity. So that would be V direct sum R infinity applied to L. That's maybe the first thing you might want to try. Well, this doesn't give the right thing. First of all, it doesn't work out syntactically because if I have W here, I'm supposed to get a subspace of the same dimension as W. But if W has larger dimension than V, so if this linear isometric embedding goes up by dimension, it doesn't fit because this still has the same dimension as V. So, and there's one thing which corrects for this thing, which also gives a beautiful equivalent homotopy type, is that you just add to this the orthogonal complement of the image in the first variable plus zero. So, which the understanding here is the zero is in the R infinity, and this is in the W, which would be the first part. This is orthogonal to the image of this. So here, the, these are complementary the dimensions. And R has the right dimension, and this has a wonderful equivalent. So the main point maybe is that to show you that there's a lot, and these are by far not all, there's a lot of really explicit examples you can write down. It's more usually relatively deep theorems to prove that the equivalent homotopy groups are what they claim they are. You know, the Burnside ring the representation, maybe that this is really. Uh, the, co the ring of G equivariant homotopy groups is isomorphic to the borders and ring of smooth closed G manifold. That's not so, so easy. Excuse me, what's the G action on this thing? Yeah, it's too good. Now you want to why? Huh? <laughs> it's just, well, it's because this is a global homotopy. I was right. not even planning to mention this global thing at all here, but this is, you know, everything, okay, this is, you can ignore this comment. Every orthogonal spectrum with trivial action can be considered as an orthogonal G action where I let G act trivially. In contrast to what you might first think that this is a stupid idea to let the group act trivial, this is a great idea. These are the global types. So this is sort of saying that's global. Okay. So um, you, just need to double check that there is no G in the O, right? The, the G is exactly. the from the type. Yeah. So for instance, the other G people like no, 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 would put it in the O already right. and then it would say G in which terms. This would right. be an equivalent one capital. Right. And so, for instance, the, 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 the suspensions, the, the, the sphere is also for, Yeah, but, but for equivalent representation, so the, the, the SOB for, for, rep, for representation sphere, sorry. So what I mean. right. This is common to exactly in 30 seconds when I define the equivalent homotopy. So maybe if the question isn't answered after that, please ask again. Okay, so now I've defined a one category. Oh, yeah. Um, what is this in this definition? You put some other finite number of copies of V plus R infinity. So if it's more than one, it's going to be the big N, so the one which is stable at the point. And that's because the first copy is sort of eaten up by the suspension coordinate. If you add something else, which as V goes to infinity, also goes to infinity, same exhaust the complete universe. Such as, for example, just one more copy of V or something else, or two more, or 17 more, doesn't matter. As long as to the one copy of V, which is secretly in the suspension coordinate, you add some other functor which has V exhausting the complete universe also exhausting, but you won't get the same that argument capital and capital O, which represents stable coordinates of G manifolds, a localization of the other theory. And that would be the one that's tied to equivalent from the universe. This one's not. So that's there's the subtlety. Accurately, there are some different homotopy types where classically there would only be one homotopy type. Anything else about this one? Okay, so then the main, probably final point, because I only have six minutes left, is we really want to do homotopy theory. And to name a homotopy theory, you shouldn't just name a category, you should also name a notion of equivalence. And then you've really picked out homotopy theory. This is kind of the pattern. Once you have a category and notion of equivalence, you might, for example, want to invert it, maybe in the classical sense, where here you would get a triangulated category. Maybe you would want to invert it in the infinity category, that sense, you get an infinity category. But just the one category isn't really what specifies a homotopy. So we need a notion of equivalence. And another nice feature with orthogonal spectra, for example, in contrast to symmetric spectra, is that you can define it by a homotopy. So I have to tell you now what the equivalent homotopy groups of an orthogonal spectrum are. This is going to define our equivalence. So the zero G equivalent homotopy group of X in a formal G spectrum um, is the following thing. So pi zero G of X 
with the co-limit over n. I'm going to tell you soon what the structure maps are of maps S n times rho g into x n times rho g, the equivalent x. And this needs some explanation. So what is rho g? That's the regular representation. With G as an orthonormal basis, n times is just an n fold direct sum of copies of the regular representation. And now, this is maybe your question. We're now evaluating at an inner product space that already has a G action. Before, we were evaluating at trivial, at just inner product spaces. Maybe inner. Now, we're evaluating at an inner product space that has a G action. And now, how are we considering this as a G space? And this is really the key sort of subtlety in the whole game. X is an orthogonal G spectrum. So whatever I put in has a G action. But now I put in a G action and the orthogonal group is the automorphism group of that. So this thing really has two G actions. One is the external G action on X. And the other one is the action on the inner product space pushed through functor reality. And we're always putting the diagonal action on this. So this is kind of the key thing, diagonal G action. So this is why even if you have an orthogonal spectrum with trivial values like the sphere spectrum. Why here, nevertheless, you get non, non trivial G spaces because we also have the orthogonal group action, and it's through these orthogonal groups actions that everything is. This is kind of the key to the whole game. So, despite the fact that the sphere spectrum and MO were orthogonal spectrum of trivial actions, non trivial G spaces come here, and that's why it's an interesting theory and not sort of a trivial theory. Okay, so maybe. Um, because I don't have so much time left, the stabilizations would be pretty much as in the classical case. You smash with the identity of another copy of the regular representation from the left, and you would have n plus one copies here, and then you use the structure map here in the target to sneak the representation inside. And this is how you stabilize from one to the next. So this gives you a functor from orthogonal G spectrum to abelian groups. Abelian groups for the same reason that non equivalently they have abelian group structures, they have a trivial coordinate. You know, the regular representation has a one dimensional trivial copy inside to use that direction to sort of pitch maps together. That's why you get a real rules. And now we can find equivalences and the genealogy of the platform to the category. And you know, I've already mentioned a couple of calculations, and I was referring to this definition as the same equivalent homotopy. Ah, um, I'm soon going to need the case equivalent homotopy group where k is an integer, and that's pretty much the same definition. If you want a positive dimensional equivalent homotopy group, you just add a trivial copy of r to the k to this. If you want a negative dimensional one, you add minus r to the minus k to this so if k is negative minus k is positive so you do an r to the minus k to this vector. this is how you define this if it's not zero and then you shift the spectrum or the spectrum and take high zero back to the next sort of thing now i can find what the stable equivalence is homomorphism f and x to y of a formal G spectrum. It's a state equivalent, or sometimes called by star isomorphism. This comes by different names. With pi k h of f from pi k h of x to pi k h of y. It's an isomorphism. For all integers k and all subgroups h of g. Well, now you could complain. I've only defined g equivalent homotopy groups, now I'm referring to h equivalent homotopy groups. This is a nice, another really nice thing here. Well, you just restrict the action. That's it. If you have a functor to g spaces, you just restrict the action, then you get a functor to h spaces, and you just take that definition with h instead of g. It's, it's that simple. And then the Jeffrey Van State homotopy category. I can now define and pick the one category of the formula G spectra and the formula the invert the stable equivalences. And again, this can be interpreted in different ways. So this is the Jeffrey variant. 
state homotopy. So this is one way of introducing it. And again, for the purposes of this, this week in my talks, you want to interpret this as the one categorical localization. And I'm out of time now, but the first thing I will start in, in the next lecture is to tell you what's the structure that makes this into a triangulated category, which is relatively simple. So the first message is it is a triangulated category, or something is added. That's a property which might not at all be obvious. If you see this for the first time, it might not be obvious why this would be added to the message. And it has a preferred structure as a triangulated category, which I will explain yeah. at the beginning of next time. Many nice properties, tensor triangulated, compactly generated, rigid. Uh, as I said, it's one of the nicest class of examples of such things. If you want to be more fancy, you can also take the infinity categorical localization here, and then you will get a presentable symmetric more stable infinity category whose homotopy category is the same, but I'm, I promise not to use infinity categories in this lecture. Okay, so that's it for today. Thank you for your attention.